Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Arzu Mohseni and I'm delighted to be here with artist Peter Bynum as we celebrate his exhibition Illuminated Paint with a What Inspires Artists series event held in conjunction with Art in the Corner Room exhibition series. Congratulations are in order to Peter and his talented team for this magnificent site-specific exhibition. Peter's sculptural paintings have been exhibited at major venues worldwide, and we are so delighted that he's openly sharing his work with New Yorkers. I'd like to take this opportunity to officially thank Peter and his team for their impressive effort making this exhibition a huge success. The interconnectedness of all life is the main influence on Peter's work. We are here to talk about that and other concepts including the behavior of paint under pressure and the disillusion of artistic ego. Peter is starting with a presentation and video screening, followed by a short discussion and audience Q&A. We promise to be done by 7.30 so everyone can enjoy the festive reception. Thank you for coming. Take it away, Peter. Thanks, Arizu. This is going to help us have a short conversation uh, about light and about paint. So let's get to it. Light. Uh, the Big Bang. The big let there be light moment came 13 billion years ago. And there was light and it was good. And now let's zoom up 13 billion years to the present over the next couple of minutes with needless to say a few uh, slight gaps. So 13 billion years ago first stars first light, four billion years ago, first life, half a billion years ago, complex life, plants, fish, reptiles, six million years ago, upright apes, two million years ago, we use tools, 200,000 years ago, you know, that's me after a rough night. <laughs> I hate Facebook. So we were Neanderthals 200,000 years ago, and uh, 40,000 years ago, there's what they call the Great Leap Forward. And we transitioned from ne Neanderthal to Homo sapien, knowing man, and the first known paintings are made at the end of long cave systems in France and Spain. This one is in Spain. Uh, red dots, probably from a shaman, animal fat, and blood and minerals spit from the mouth on the cave walls. So fast forward 5,000 years, and now we're at 35,000 years ago, we get handprints uh, blown from the mouth, again, like an airbrush, <laughs> like a stencil, leaving these prints on the wall. And we have the first expression of self-identity. Fast forward another 5,000 years ago, to uh, another 5,000 years, to 30,000 years ago, and we get what most people think of when they think of cave paintings and the first paintings. And we have bison and hunting scenes, again presumed to be made by shamans, hoping for a good hunt. And with this, I want to contend, narrative painting is born. And we're off to the races. From then on, painting is intentional mark making, by artists to tell a story. Stories about ourselves, the human autobiography, self-defining cultural constructs, narrative scripts, meaning making. And after paint, uh, cave painting, we get fertility art, warrior art, uh, Egyptian tomb painting with stories about the afterlife, Greek art obsessed with proportions, Asian art, very meditative, kabuki paintings, erotica, Islamic art, an emphasis on uh, pattern and mazes, the Renaissance, and now we're up to the 14-1500s with the most famous painting in the world. And the world's wondering, what's the story behind that smile? Baroque art, more stories about God and war, romanticism, focused on the individual and the imagination, on up through Duchamp and Picasso and Matisse, and abstract expressionism, how do we feel? 
minimalism, getting rid of all those gooey feelings and uh, getting narrative down to its barest elements, but it's still narrative. Warhol with a focus on consumerism and celebrity, deconstructivism and text-based art on into today with Damien Hirst Dots, inspired by memories of his father painting blue dots on the door of their house, and identity-based art uh, talking about race, that's Gehinda Wiley, and gender, Micheline Thomas. And we can't go uh, further, of course, without mentioning Jeff Koons, who New York Magazine declared the most successful American artist since Warhol, uh, with yet more Warholian narrative about capitalist consumer culture and commodity fetishism and his sex life, uh, I can't show, show you those paintings. This is the library. And now, all this time, ever since those red handprints on the cave wall, through 40,000 years of human storytelling, 40,000 years of narrative, 40,000 years of human constructs, 40,000 years of collective autobiography, paint has held its tongue. Sitting in a can or a tube, in the closet, literally and figuratively, quietly waiting for the artist to express something. But I don't think paint wants to be quiet. I think paint wants to express itself. Paint's just dying to come out of the closet and express its own true nature. This is real time, by the way. This is not slow mode. This is not sped up real time. It's almost like it's had a secret life all along. Life being the operative word here. Because it turns out that paint behaves like a living organism and creates complex nervous systems, which is why I say the nature of paint is to act like nature. And I think if we allow paint to express its true nature, that we might better see our own nature. So instead of paint being something for me to manipulate, something that expresses what I want to express, I wanted to give up control of the paint and allow paint to express itself. Because I feel like paint's a lot more intelligent, with all due respect, than you or me. So in letting paint express this intelligence, it's really about just getting the artistic ego out of the way getting out of the way of the paint, getting away from what the artist Paul McCarthy calls the myth of artistic greatness. When I make these paintings, I just stand back and watch while paint expresses this organic branching architecture, this creative impulse, this very sophisticated language, creating a system of dendrite and synapses as complex as any living organism, as vast as any network of ideas or memories in the human brain. To illuminate um, these branching dendrites, I worked with an optical scientist to um, develop these thin light panels. And you can adjust them up and down. So there's 50 different levels of lighting available to the viewer here from full brightness, which is what they're at now, to um, all the way off. So the viewer becomes a participant in the creative decision making. This was um, commissioned by the Museum of Art and Design up the street here at Columbus Circle to go next to a light work by James Terrell. Um, and there was a remote dimmer on a stand uh, next to the paintings, you see it there at the bottom right of the image on a lanyard, and you could pull the remote dimmer out about four or five feet and stand in the middle um, of that middle section and control the light and brighten it up or dim it down in the museum. And then the next person could come and dim it or brighten it as they liked. So it's participatory, and over the course of the nine months, that it was there, this painting became, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different paintings with different people leaving it at different light levels. 
So I've already let, uh, let go of controlling the paint. And with this way of doing things, I'm also letting go of control of what the painting looks like. To me, um, the history of the relationship between paint and light is, is so interesting. Um, we know that the very first paintings were visible only by firelight. They were at the very end of uh, vast cave systems. And natural sunlight was used when painting on glass was popular from about uh, 500 AD to the Middle Ages. But with the Middle Ages came uh, wars and plagues and famines and um, almost all the glass was, was smashed by marauding peasants and uh, angry soldiers. Um, and so painting on glass with the sunlight coming through the glass and illuminating the painting was abandoned. And they said, all right, no more of this. Uh, let's go back to canvas. So um, with painting on glass basically wiped out, um, painters went back to canvas and took to depicting light on canvas. So you think of Rembrandt, The Night Watch, Vermeer, Girl with the Pearl Earring, Turner, uh, The Burning of the Houses of Parliament, Monet, of course, Water Lilies, The Hudson River School, that's uh, Frederick Church, that's the Luminous uh, subdivision of the uh, Hudson River School of Painting. And then coming on up more to modern times, maybe you'd think of Francis Bacon. You might think of uh, Ross Blechner. And, and then you have not painters, but artists who use light in their work. This is Dan Flavin, James Terrell, who took over the Guggenheim a few months ago. And this is Doug Wheeler. Uh, I was at this installation in Chelsea um, about six months ago, and it was very disorienting, and people were actually walking into walls and walking to the screen. And uh, uh, the poor guy almost just quit being an artist because he got sued once, because people, somebody got so disoriented, they fell down and hurt themselves. They had no idea where they were. Um, so I wanted to kind of combine these ideas and make paintings on glass um, so the, the paint could hover in light, be suffused with light, be saturated with light, um, really swim in light. And so you could really see these branches, these dendrites on multiple layers. Uh, this is nine layers of glass here. Uh, so light takes on volume here and light becomes sculptural. So I wanted to have a conversation with painting about opaque versus transparent surfaces. Uh, inviting the idea of um, opacity in painting as an option, not a given. And I wanted to have a conversation with painting about ways of suspending paint in the air and exploding the layers. So painting has more options to be sculpture, sculptural, uh, if it would like. I'm not saying it's better, just different. Um, uh, but to, to, to be sculptural instead of just being paint essentially on one layer of uh, canvas or board. But what all this light and glass is really in the service of, what it's here for, is to illuminate paint's complex intelligence. This branching architecture, these dendrites uh, found throughout nature. We see them in trees, in root systems, in coral, in the cardiovascular network, this is a hand and wrist. In lungs, our respiratory system. In the optical network that we're seeing all this with right now. And in the neural network that's um, processing all our thoughts right now. I, ho I hope they're good thoughts. Uh, uh, and so, what, you know, what kills me is that where complex organisms took millions, hundreds of millions of years to develop these very sophisticated um, systems for survival, 
Paint creates them in a matter of seconds. This branching architecture, this branching design, these systems of dendrite that operate in a unified field are so smart, they're like the brain's brain. Uh, thoughts travel through a system of neurons and communicate uh, with other neurons through branching dendrites um, that look like this. This is actually um, a dendrite reacting to an optical stimulation. Uh, and this is one one hundredth the size of a human hair. And we've known for years uh, that this is where learning and memory happen. As a matter of fact, in Alzheimer's patients, what happens is the dendrites are foreshortened. So instead of being like this, where an electrical charge can jump from one dendrite to another and thought and memory happen, they get shortened so the dendrites are further away from each other and the charge can't reach and memory fails. Now, in as much as you, uh, you know, you can accept or reject the metaphysical claims of neuroscientists, but they would say that in as much as you can speak of a seat of consciousness, this is it. That the full content of conscious experience happens in these dendrites. Back to pain. When it's put under pressure, the nature of pain is to act like nature. And I think that when we let pain express its true organic nature, it can teach us about our own true nature and help us transcend personal and cultural mythologies. From tree limbs reaching for light, to roots in the ground searching for nutrition, to coral in the ocean, to the vascular networks that carry blood and breath through the body and make seeing and thinking possible for every person on the planet. The natural world figured this stuff out a long time ago figured out the life force a long time ago, and it feels to me like this is the life force in action. That it creates, paint creates a liquid flow of creative energy. And you can call it the life force, the drive to survive, a biochemical impulse, chi, prana, whatever you like, but it's a universal creative impulse that distinguishes something that's alive from something that's not alive. And I, I think when we see this, we just get it. No interpretation needed. We see life. And that cuts across cultures. I think anyone looking at these paintings is going to have pretty much the same experience, no matter the country, the religion, the ideology, the age, the language, the education level, the income level, the time period, 100 years ago, 100 years from now urban, rural. So maybe, instead of seeing ourselves through a paradigm of individual identity or cultural separateness, we experience a decreased attachment to the self and an increased awareness of the whole. And maybe, for a minute, the ego dissolves language and culture and dogmas fall away. We see our own true nature and we find connection. Thank you.